<laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for reminding me for all the from all, uh, all the people I plagiarized when I wrote that book. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, is there an original thought in it? Um, and thank you for the illusion, Barbara, about uh, uh, my family being the, uh, the affinity for gangs. I've never heard that one. That's a good one. <laughs> Uh, privilege to be with all of you. Uh, it was uh, just a grace to be with my brother Steve and sister-in-law Teresa last night. Uh, heroic, holy people in my life. A lot of good friends. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to yak for a while and then maybe we'll do a little question and answer and then we'll sign more books. I suspect that, uh, and thank you to IBC uh, for your vision and your goodness and your uh, commitment to live the gospel. To live as though the truth were true and to put first things recognizably first, I invite all of you to uh, participate in that uh, worthy, noble program. What brings us here this afternoon, I suspect, is not me, but the fact that all of us want to imagine the world to look differently than it currently looks. The prophet Habakkuk writes, the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint, and if it delays, Wait for it. But none of us, uh, because we want to live our faith, we don't want to kind of just sit around, you know, con los brazos cruzados, uh, tapping our feet and staring at our watch. We really want to make something happen. And here's what I want to suggest uh, for you this uh, afternoon, what it is that we want to make happen. We want to create a community of kinship such that God might recognize it. That's the goal. That's the goal of all our efforts, really. Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly, I think, when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that we belong? That's the task. How do we create a community where there is no us and them, but just us, especially now in a climate of, shall I say, um, a division and polarization, especially in the, in the wake of our recent election? How do we live uh, God's dream come true as Jesus articulates it so clearly that you may be one? That's the hope. How do we imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? And to that end, every single one of us in this church is called to stand at the very margins, at the edges of that circle so that it will widen because we've chosen to stand there. And you stand with very specific folk, with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. You stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. You stand with those whose dignity has been denied. With any luck, you get to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out. And on particularly grace days, you even get to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. We want to widen this circle of compassion and that's the invitation that's common to all of us. It's been the privilege of my life to work at Homeboy Industries for, uh, to be around uh, gang members for the last quarter of a century. Just about anything important I've ever learned, I've learned uh, from them about nobility and courage and proximity to God. Uh, one of the things they've been teaching me quite a bit is texting. Um, <laughs> I don't know, what did we do before this? Uh, uh, it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. And, and I'm quite dexterous at it. I, uh, you know, I don't do it while I'm driving. So, uh, uh, but LOL, OMG, BTW, I'm, I'm pretty good at it. There's a new one the homies taught me, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh hell no. <laughs> I've been using that one quite a bit lately. So I'm in a car with Manuel and Poncho, and two homies, older guys who work for me, were driving to Palm Desert to speak at a high school. And they do a variety of things at Homeboy Industries. The older guys, mid-twenties, been to prison, tatted down, tattoos all over the place. And we're, we meet at nine and we make our trek. And somewhere about 9.30, uh, Manuel's in the front seat and you can hear, zzz, incoming, a text. And he reads it and he chuckles. 
I go, what is it? He you know it's dumb, he says. It's from Snoopy back at the office. Well, I just saw Snoopy when we gathered at nine. Snoopy works with Manuel in the clock-in room where they clock in hundreds of um, our workers at Homeboy Industries. I said, well, what's it say? Oh, it's stupid. Let me just... Um, hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. <laughs> You have to come down right now. Show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, we died laughing, the three of us. And then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They are from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other. Now they shoot text messages and there's a word for that and the word is kinship how can we seek a kind of compassion that can stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it you know a lot of times uh, we lionize the idea of service and, and well we should because it's obviously a good thing but we have to see service as the starting point. You don't end with service. Service is the hallway that leads you to the ballroom, but get to the ballroom because that's kinship. Because even there's a distance in service, a service provider, service recipient. There's still daylight separating us, and we want to obliterate the illusion that there is distance, that there is an us and a them. Compassion is not the relationship between the healer and the wounded, it's a covenant between equals. One of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez, and I remember a, re a reporter had said to him, wow, those farm workers sure love you. And he smiled and shrugged and said, it's mutual. That's the kind of idea of kinship that God's hope is and Jesus' hope in saying that you may be one, that it may be mutual, no distance at all. I remember there was a homie named Caesar, and we all called him Dreamer, and I knew him since he was a little kid growing up in the projects, and he, uh, uh, nobody's gotten more jobs through Homeboy Industries than this guy Caesar, either outside in the private sector or in Homeboy Industries over the last two decades. But he would always sort of wander back to getting high and getting into trouble and be in and out of being locked up. And, but this one time he came to see me some years ago um, and he had just been released after a year stretch in prison. And, and he says what homies always say, this time will be different, he says, you know. So I called a friend of mine who owns a um, vending machine company in Alhambra and, and he hired Caesar right on the spot. So two weeks later, the Caesar's in my office and he's proudly waving his very first paycheck. And he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. Yeah, my mom, she's proud of me. My kids, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, oh, gosh, um, who? And he looked at me strangely and he said, well, God, of course. <laughs> No, sure. That's right. Yep, God, yeah. Um, he looked at me and he said, You thought I was going to say you, didn't you? No. Uh, God's number one, yeah. He said, You are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. I'm sorry, them Genesis days? He goes, Yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already by now. <laughs> And suddenly kinship so quickly. It's not about service provider, service recipient, healer, wounded. It's about us being in this together. It's about kinship. I never felt that more keenly in my own life. And then in the last uh, few years, I struggled a little bit with health and uh, uh, had leukemia and um, went through chemotherapy and feeling pretty good at the moment. Uh, or as the homies still endlessly say to me, I hear your cancer's in intermission. 
I said, yeah, apparently it stepped out to the lobby to buy popcorn. <laughs> May the line be long. <clears throat> so this news got broadcast on the front page of the Sunday LA Times, you know, and word spread quite quickly among the gang world. And, uh, and I would just, my voicemail got filled up. I remember a homegirl named China left me a message uh, at home. Now it's our turn to take care of you. Very sweet. Remember I sitting at my desk, big huge homie named Grumpy, about six foot five, huge guy with tattoos, standing in front of my desk. Apparently God had forgotten to give him a neck, you know, and he's, <laughs> he's standing there with big tears in his eyes and he says, what do I have that you need? Yeah, meaning organs. <laughs> really happy to tell him I didn't need any of his organs. Thank you very much. One of my favorites was a little 15-year-old knucklehead uh, gang member who, who kind of got the word fr fairly late in the game. At that point, I'd been going through lots of chemo, and, and the homies would always drive me to my chemo and pick me up. I always wanted to do it alone, stay there alone, but they'd pick me up. They liked doing that. And then I'd, they'd take me back to the office where I'd kind of stay for some time. I, I'd rather be there than any place else. But this one day, I come back from a treatment, and I'm sitting there behind the desk, and this 15-year-old this knucklehead gang member comes in, and he sits down, and, and he looks positively stricken, you know. I hear you have leukemia. I said, yeah, I do. And there's this awkward silence. My cat had leukemia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she died. <laughs> oh, gosh, I...